Welcome to the third episode of Modern Marketing TV. Today we have Bert Marivoet as a guest. Bert is uh, known as uh, head of sales at the Persgroep and lead of Twitter Belgium. And today we are going to discuss everything social media and influencer marketing related. Bert, hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, Anik. What should people know about you? You've told everything. <laughs> no, uh, what should people know about me? I think um, probably the most surprising thing is that I actually started uh, my career in the digital space uh, with Skynet. Uh, when Skynet was still a big portal, I think you're even too young uh, for this to know. I know it, but I never was a... Skynet.be. Uh, yeah. yeah. uh, MS everybody was going to MSN and, uh, and Skynet uh, uh, to get their news. That was way before HLN and Newsblood and stuff like that were uh, giving news to us uh, on, on their online sites. Um, and I actually started there uh, with a, a product uh, they uh, got a license on, which was called sms to mail and it was um, one of the first uh, interactive uh, tools between on and offline because the whole idea was I, I'm walking in Antwerp city, I see a movie poster, I send uh, a message to the short code 4480, whatever, and I get uh, an SMS back to say, now we need your email address. You, do, you all do this once, and then you get an email with the trailer of the movie. Yeah. But that was obviously before smartphones. Yeah, <laughs> when conversions were still easy. When conversions <laughs> were uh, near to 100%. Yeah, okay. amazing. <laughs> uh, miss those times. Yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, thanks. Um, but let's start with a very open question. It's Modern Marketing TV. What is Modern Marketing to you? Modern Marketing to me is doing marketing as we're living in 2019. Okay. I think very, very few brands are uh, aware or at least are admitting that they are uh, missing about 50% of the eyeballs by doing stuff that nobody cares about anymore. Uh, I think of some statistics like uh, a couple of months ago, I, it was uh, published that less than half of uh, Belgians are watching uh, TV live, right? So uh, before it was like 80 or 90% and now it's, it's half of them and it's, it's dropping real quickly. So uh, one, in, one on three is watching Netflix. So as an advertiser, I should already uh, think that they would be cutting their TV budgets, budgets in half. But that's still not the case for many <laughs> no, no, brands, By far not. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working with a lot of uh, fast-moving brands like Danone and, and other telcos like uh, Orange who are still uh, spending a lot on TV while nobody, or at least, I, I yeah. shouldn't say nobody, but a lot of people are There's just completely of, missing. Uh, a lot uh, of waste in the budget, probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so one of the big questions then is, where do I have to be as yeah. being a modern marketeer? Uh, and then you probably would say, okay, we need to go full on digital. Um, but then you have the whole ad blocker uh, phenomenon. <laughs> I, as you introduced me, I used to work for the Perscope and it was already like three to four. No, I'm talking five to six years ago where we saw about 30% of ad blockers. So that's a whole inventory uh, which is gone completely. My guess it's above 50 now, 50% 50 on uh, who's using it. Are you using ad blockers? Uh, yeah, should I say it in front of the camera? But yeah, I'm, I'm using an ad blocker, but just uh, in some cases okay. uh, it's limited, <laughs> but yeah, yeah I'm okay. using one like most people. Yeah, I think. exactly. Um, so digital is, is a hard one to still reach people as a, as a brand. Uh, and then you have social, and uh, that's one of the main reasons actually why I started Native Nation is because I used to be at Twitter. Uh, when I started, we, s we saw like uh, engagement rates of easily five plus five percent. And when I was three years later um, about to leave Twitter, it was under three percent. Um, so what you see is uh, a whole generation actually is opting out on social uh, of brands. Um, just take a look, for example, uh, Jupiler, big brand in Belgium. Uh, I think it's, they, they have about 400,000 fans on Facebook. 
on Instagram they have about seven thousand. So it's it's yeah, a yeah, big big gap, yeah. and 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 there's a whole bunch of uh, young uh, millennials who just don't feel the need of following a brand anymore, um, and that's a big big challenge. And so that's and why. How do you solve that as a brand? Um. Well, we think uh, one of one of the solutions is uh, to create branded content, but not starting from the brand, but working with content creators. So that's why our focus is completely to on that. actually create value uh, marketing instead of interrupt interruptive marketing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. You just mentioned uh, your time at Twitter. Uh, of course, I wanted to ask you some questions about that as well. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people, mainly here in Belgium, always say, yeah, Twitter is dead. And uh, yeah, you were one of the insiders. And in the past, you always gave me like very good tips and tricks to use Twitter and Twitter advertising. But uh, I think I can ask you the question, is Twitter still alive and kicking? Or, or yeah. what is the status now? I think it... Uh well, when you look at uh, at the stock, uh, it's it, it's it, it's doubled since I left, uh, unfortunately, uh, for me then. <laughs> so it's doing. I think the company is doing great. Uh, it it will. It has always been a kind of a niche platform, and most of all also Belgian marketeers uh, were thinking of okay, it's social, and they're bench benching it the whole time against Facebook and others like Instagram. But Twitter is a special platform. Um, they're still about, I know it because they're, I'm, I'm still in contact with a lot of Twitter people. We're still in Belgium about 1.5 million active Twitter users, which is not... Uh, and what is active? Is it monthly active? or is Yeah, it it's uh, MAUs, okay. monthly uh, active users. Uh, but the thing with Twitter is there's much more daily active users than monthly active users uh, in, in compared to other platforms. Um, and I think one of the most surprising stats probably when I tell this to people is the biggest uh, audience group on Twitter, also in Belgium, is uh, 16 to 24 year olds. Um, it's not everybody saying, okay, uh, it's journalists, it's press people, it's uh, politicians who are on Twitter. But actually the teenagers and, and the, the young students are one of the most active uh, uh, people on Twitter. So I, I follow them, some of them just to see and they're just, I mean, you and I don't know or don't use Twitter this way, but they 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 are sending tweets like, Wow, it's so hot outside. I, I wish my boyfriend was here because I'm feeling uh, kind of depressed and I get 500 retweets. I yeah, don't know, the last are. time you, you had 500 retweets. Yeah, the <laughs> thing that was never. <laughs> uh, so they, yeah. Yeah, they use it as, 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 as their own means to, to, to communicate in a way that we don't know. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. And uh, what made you decide to leave Twitter then? Um, Very honestly, it was one of the biggest uh, or one of the hardest uh, things for me to do. I, I really, really loved working for Twitter. Because you left yourself. Huh? Yeah, I, I left myself. No, no, actually, they closed down the office. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, kind of a, a cool story for me uh, because I, I, I checked it. I actually um, started my own company. Well, I, I registered it in, in April 2016. And I was about to uh, quit the company um, and then we're talking uh, I was I was gonna quit the company end of November and they actually closed down the offices uh, uh, Benelux uh, so Belgium and the Netherlands uh, at uh, the end of October so just when I was about to uh, was resign like, they uh, the gave golden me a big handshake. Bonus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. And then, because hey, you mentioned you you registered your company earlier, yeah. so you were yeah. already playing with a new exactly. idea in your mind. Yeah. Uh, that was probably then what is Native Nation today. Mm -hmm. Where did that idea uh, came from? And for the viewers of the show, yeah, what is uh, a Native Nation? Yeah. So actually, the the whole idea. Um, so I, I I wasn't really in my head. I wasn't ready to leave Twitter because I think. Uh, but I loved working for them. I loved traveling to uh, San Francisco the whole time. I think it's a very um, energetic company. Um, and it all started actually uh, being a lot in San Francisco. I saw and I met a lot of young entrepreneurs. I think uh, 
like the these guys especially in silicon valley they 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 know how to uh ignite and 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 uh enforce their um motivation on on, on just building stuff um and i was completely uh, in love with all ideas so i i'm i'm quite a, a late uh born entrepreneur if you want to um because i i just uh, started thinking about starting my own company uh about uh three years ago now um but i had to do it i i knew uh how the whole social media ecosystem was evolving i saw uh, when I started Native Nation, almost nobody in Belgium was talking talking about influencers. Uh, it, it didn't get any press. It didn't get any B two B press either. Um, so when I started it, I knew it was a good timing because I saw it coming, obviously, from the states and the Netherlands. And uh, I said, okay, there is a real opportunity in Belgium to to jump into this uh, gap. And yeah, of course, there there. I, I think uh, influencers can bring a lot of good things to a company and to a brand. But there there were already like a lot of platforms in Europe that focused on uh, yeah the the, the structuring uh, the influencer marketing for companies but what's the difference with what you offer with native nation because i think you guys focus a lot on content and mm -hmm. yeah i think our uh at least my conviction from right from the beginning was i i i i had a very um healthy frustration when i saw um the the few um influencer content on uh, on instagram in belgium at least was very old school PR like. It was like, okay, um, hi guys, let me have a selfie. I'm uh, representing Spot today. Yeah. And and tomorrow Avion. And tomorrow <laughs> Avion. Uh, so it was complete, um, uh, a complete mess. No, no real branding, um, and it was very cheap. And that's what it's. It's a bit like, and it wasn't even a fault of the influencer. I think. I think it was a fault of the brands. Hiring the agencies who said, okay, yeah, let's make it easy. Let's give them a bottle of spa and have them take a cool picture and let them post it and everybody will like it and we'll sell more spa. Um, our conviction from the beginning was if, if we want to um, really change the whole influencer marketing game, we need always to start from a creative uh, point of view um, because that's what I saw first row on Twitter. Um, if you had a great creative post, you you don't need any paid media budget to, to get great scores. Um, when I talked about the engagement rates earlier, um, six to, we, we made things for uh, Fox, for example, the, the movie company, who we, we saw engagement rates of over 50%, five zero. So, so it was crazy and almost no paid media budget behind it. Um, and, and, and that's what, I always thought, okay, if we want to reach the followers of these influencers, we need to be able to create co-create co content with them uh, in a very creative way to make sure uh, that we can create impact for the brands. Because uh, when when I uh, announced internally in my company that I was doing the show and that I would, would be talking about influencer marketing, of course, there's always with a lot of people a very negative connotation. Uh, and you already mentioned some of the reasons why people are very uh, skeptical against uh, influencer marketing. Um, but what would you tell these people on the right ways to do it? Um, uh, well, I think first of all, brands shouldn't copy paste any of the tactics that they are doing on social media and just uh, try to turn this into an influencer marketing campaign. We still get briefings like uh, make sure our, our brand logo is within the post. I mean, that's complete bullshit. Can we swear on this uh, channel? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, <laughs> um, so just think about when you're seeing a, a content creator posting a cool pic where, for example, just one example, we're working for Jeep, for example, it would completely destroy the post to, and, and they didn't, they, they, they're not the ones who asked us just to, to make sure. Um, but it would completely destroy the, the authenticity of the post by, by uh, trying to slide in a logo uh, for a brand. And so that's one of our biggest struggles today is uh, a lot of, 
brands understand the potential of influencer marketing, but they're so used to having these uh, old school tactics. So that's we, we, we are training them, developing them to, to understand that when you start from a creative point of view and you try to, to create real uh, value and, and, and create posts with high production value, then um, then you can really create impact and, and what we call create thumb stopping content. That's our mission. We want to stop those thumbs. Yeah. Okay, and that's an, a very nice mission statement. Um, to build further on that, um, yeah, you guys create like a lot of content and I know some of the examples for Mentos, for example. Yeah, they, th those are really cool cases. But yeah, you work for very big brands. So I think the cost is probably quite high to get started with influencer marketing or would you disagree with that? No, well, quite high. It's relative, right? I mean, um, when, I, when I see um, what some of our brands are still spending on platforms like Facebook, I think it's uh, relatively cheap to do an influencer marketing campaign with us. Um, but I agree that um, we have a lot of brands coming to us and saying, okay, I have like three or 5,000 euros and we want to uh, create this great campaign. For us, that's not working um, because we know um, that if you're just, uh, again, sending a couple of bottles to an influencer, you can do it. But then that's what you, you're getting. It's just a spike probably in the... Uh, yeah, or not even. And uh, some people will, will have even uh, noticed the, the, that somebody is posing with a bottle, but it's not going to create the same emotion or the no. same engagement. So you're actually saying that influencer marketing is more of a long-term strategy then? Mm. Well, at least uh, for us, it's important that clients understand that if, if they want to... Um, create engagement and, and try to make a uh, have a kind of a love brand on social that they need to uh, invest in it like like a professional platform and not just trying to throw some money to a, a nice face and say okay let's uh, spray and pray as yeah, we say and interrupt people's yeah, uh, exactly. daily activities yeah. to make them look at our brand exactly yeah, i agree um yeah let's dive into more of the examples on influencer marketing can you Give and, and tell us some more about one of the cases you guys have been working on. Oh. Um, so we focus on first of all on on the bigger brands. We, we from the start uh, we knew there there's kind of a uh, a great link to uh, insert influencer marketing in a 360 story. Um, so our focus is to create content for brands that they can then af after the uh, after we created the content or co-created the content that they can repurpose this content and for example use it in in paid media on uh, Facebook or create pre-rolls uh, etc. Um, so our, our our biggest focus, we work, for example, for uh, TUI, where we send people. We always try to avoid to say, okay, let's send a, um, a typical travel influencer and have them uh, tell their story. We, uh, in most of the cases, we even, uh, especially when it's 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 um, like a celeb influencer, we always send a professional crew with them, which for a lot of brands, especially in the beginning, was like a crazy idea to them to say, okay, but they're influencers, why do they need a photographer or a camera crew? But that's the way we know it works best because imagine you uh, being in Sri Lanka, for example, you, you can't create great content the whole time on your own. Uh, it's impossible, the whole selfie time is gone. Um, so we try to create as much content within a short time span and then and and then cut it into different uh, assets um, to have to have a uh, enough content for like for example to 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 cover a whole month of social media yeah yeah you mentioned what what you tell the brands but what do you tell the brands about the yeah, the ideal ingredients for a successful influencer campaign i think authenticity for example is yeah. super important yeah we 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 do Actually, we do two things. First of all, um, so the way we work is uh, we get a briefing and we start with our creative team developing a, a concept on it. So actually, and I think it would be probably surprising to most of uh, your uh, viewers, 
but about, I think, 80% of our revenue is coming from creative and, and uh, production services. It's only uh, roughly 20% going to influencer fees, which is completely the opposite of, of most influencer platforms, right? So we, we, we specialize in creating this content, but we look at three parameters. We have our own checklist. Um, so first of all, obviously, we look if there's a, a great brand fit between the influencer and the, and the proper brand. Um, so actually, one of the, 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 the biggest mistakes that brands come to us is thinking, okay, we really love this girl. We think she's great for us. And then maybe she's allergic to whatever, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. hot chocolate, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. So it's it's not because uh, it's a great radio presenter that she's a, a great brand fit. Um, that's an obvious one. But also we look at the tone of voice. Um, maybe she's a great uh, beauty influencer, but the tone of voice might not fit your brand because uh, she's especially um, using um, a kind of language that doesn't fit your, uh, your own uh, DNA from your brand. And then third of all, what we do is really look at the content relevance of this influencer. Um, it's not because um, you want to reach 15-year-old girls that you should, for the, uh, within the same example, you shouldn't send a beauty influencer to uh, to Sri Lanka with Tui just because she's reaching uh, a lot of 16-year-olds, for example, or 18-year-olds. So it, it, it really has to fit within their own um, Instagram feed in this example to make sure it's it's done well. So it's, it's not such an easy task to find the right fit between, um, between an influencer and a brand. Um, and then secondly, we developed, uh, which is also, I think, unique in Belgium. I'm not sure any other companies uh, are doing this, but we developed a whole um, AI um, tool, um, which actually is going to check how, uh, how many uh, real followers does an influencer have? How many has he bought in the past or not? The engagement uh, rate. The engagement rate, yeah. is it a true one? Is it, uh, so we actually give a creator scoreboard, uh, yeah. to, a score to, to all of our, uh, so we have a platform about 1500 influencers are on it okay. uh, nowadays. We have a whole search engine behind it. We can easily say, okay, um, we need influencers reaching a lot of 16 to 24, uh, 24 year olds in Antwerp. We have it in 20 seconds from our platform. Yeah. But then there's the whole um, authenticity uh, guarantee yeah. we give to our brands to make sure that they're, uh, that they're not just uh, funny guys stealing yeah, uh, or sure. buying uh, yeah. likes in Hong Kong. Yeah, and that you're not uh, probably using the same influencers for every brand. Exactly, uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. okay, but I like the checklist. So brand fit, uh, tone of voice, content relevancy, and then on top of that, you do uh, a, a with your check. AI with yeah. your AI tool, you do a, a autom an automated check yeah. probably. So that's pretty uh, exactly pretty nice. I think it's unique. Yeah. So yeah, that's, we've uh, been working on it for two and a half years, so it must <laughs> it's be been quite an investment. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> okay, and then uh, we earlier talked about one of your campaigns. Yeah, you just mentioned all the um, yeah the good the, the, the good things that make the perfect influencer campaign. Mm -hmm. What is the perfect campaign for you? Give us can you give us an example? You get bonus points if you don't uh, use <laughs> one of your own <laughs> cases. <laughs> okay, that's a great one. I I, I won't mention uh, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> actually one of the the last ones we really were looking jealously at it uh, was uh, a campaign from H and M. Um, they sent it was with a lot of. European uh, content creators. One of uh, the the Belgian girls uh, was um, Pauline Remis, uh, which one of the fashion influencers. But it was amazing uh, to see the speed they were um, producing and editing uh, the content because they were flying to Arizona, if I'm if I'm right, for uh, H&M Studio. Uh, so it's 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 a whole new line they they launched. Uh, but you saw. Pauline like leaving in Belgium, uh, making stories uh, while on the plane and while arriving in the States. 
And then just a couple of hours later, the whole content was on uh, H&M uh, on, on the website. So that's the speed we love to work uh, at uh, ourselves. Um, and it's not easy to, to, because the whole magic kind of disappears when stories are so b big on Instagram uh, nowadays. And it's, it's a real pity when uh, brands, for whatever reason, need to leave uh, a couple of weeks between people on the experience creating stories and then a couple of weeks later you can only see a post so that's why we also try to shorten the 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 publish times between uh, those two great answer i have two two questions uh, coming from that is the first one is um yeah what defines the success of an influencer marketing campaign for you is it the reach the engagement or what should we look at we, we actually developed our own roi uh, methods of course. <laughs> um where well we developed it ourselves in partnership with uh, with an american company uh they we met uh, each other like two years ago on a conference uh an influencer marketing conference because we were really trying to get our head around how can we show our brands that it's actually giving them a great return it's not that you believe in your own services that it's actually creating because return that's also some of the things uh, I, I mentioned the negative connotation of influencer marketing yeah is it is it measurable actually these days because yeah of course you can work with coupons probably but yeah not for every campaign because that's also a bit uh, yeah the same the, the too much of the same thing of course. but how do you guys do that we actually We give a different weight to uh, likes, comments, and shares uh, because we know liking on Instagram is really easy. Uh, commenting is already a bit trickier, right? Uh, when you, when when people comment on your post, it means they're really engaged. Um, and then sharing is impossible on on, on uh, Instagram, of course, but we use it for Facebook campaigns or for Twitter campaigns. So we give different weights to it. And actually, for us. I know it's working because we see we have a benchmark nowadays of over 250 campaigns, more or less, with the more or less the, the good campaigns are near to 100, between 150 and 170 percent ROI. And uh, the, the, the more difficult ones are just about 120, 125 percent of ROI. I like the mechanism you guys use, but do, is, is this manual labor or is this... Uh, no, it's all automated? automated. And which tool do you use for that? We or? build it. Oh, you build it. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I think there is nothing in the market that that's a question I get from a lot of companies. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, uh, yeah, how do you measure everything and how do you structure it uh, yeah. in an automated way? But that's still a It's a, a, it's gap a in tough the one. Yeah. yeah. We, we chose... We've, chosen so far not to um, make it a service model like a SaaS uh, model. To, so we just keep our platform and our uh, ROI tools for our own clients. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, really an added value that we give to our brands to, to ensure them that they are not uh, just throwing, throwing away their money. Okay, cool. Um, and then my second question, because I had two questions, but okay. I speak a lot. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, you mentioned Pauline, which is yeah. she's like one of the famous, uh, for those who don't know, I think she's one of the most yeah, famous yeah, Belgian probably. Uh, yeah. fashion influencers. Um, and for me, all the people like her, they have like a lot of followers. Um, but 
Do you also work with micro influencers or, or what's your take on that? How do you see that? Because for some companies, I can think it's a, yeah. Yeah, a, 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 a method that might be quite more uh, reachable. Yeah, exactly. So um, obviously, when I said that we have l about 1,500 content creators, it's well, first of all, it's Belgium and the Netherlands together because we work on uh, those two countries. Um, but there's... Uh, a whole bunch of micro influencers on our platform. Um, typically, our business model doesn't really allow to work um, only with micro influencers because, um, as I mentioned before, we, we invest a lot in creation, a lot in production. And um, so it's difficult to um, invest a lot of uh, in, in, in the production value and then have it distributed only by micro influencers because then you see that you you spend a lot of money in the first uh, phase and then you only reach maybe I don't know 5,000 people on Instagram um, so there's two things to that um, first of all I think uh, there's a big misunderstanding uh, typically from brands to think that uh, micro-influencers are more authentic than bigger influencers. Uh, we see it on our scoreboard ourselves. A lot of the smallest influencers we see are active in uh, the, the comment pods, are uh, doing a lot of tricks to get noticed and try to build up a reach, which is way less authentic than the bigger ones. Um, our sweet spot really is uh, influencers who have between uh, 35 and 70,000. Uh, those are for us the best to work with uh, in terms of engagement rate and reaching Belgian followers because the biggest ones, of course, also have a big following in the Netherlands, m maybe even the States. So you're, you're paying for an audience that isn't even in Belgium. Uh, so we try to avoid this too. Okay. Um, and a second, uh, secondly, we don't do any seedings, for example. We never uh, send any products and say, hey, have fun. Uh, just uh, Okay, you never do it because we, we that's what people, a lot of people think when they hear influencer yeah, marketing. We, we, it's, it's, it's hard as a startup to say no to briefings and, and clients, uh, but we've been very stubborn to, to say no, we won't uh, send our products and, and, and just pray to see if there's maybe a nice post coming from, uh, from it. Um, but we see some brands, for example, like typically have very uh, low budgets and can just pay for the whole creative and production part. So uh, that's the reason why we'll be launching in a couple of weeks, uh, like a second uh, product, if you want to, within Native Nation. It's gonna call it, it's gonna be called Fresh Fire, and there we're gonna do a minimum of creative input, but we will never just uh, send. It. So, so we're gonna help. The, the smaller brands to say, okay, we can still select and give you a guarantee of, of, of having real reach. We, we do a little tweak on, on a, and we, we still send them a creative brief to all of them. Um, but we're uh, definitely gonna show them how to work with micro influencers and not just let them do it. Yeah, but you launch that new brand because you feel the need in the market probably. Yeah, because we think, uh, if not 70% on of, of the influencers on our platform are never getting any briefings from us. So we want to do, it's gonna be a test. Okay, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then my uh, final question, uh, because we want to, we want to offer uh, as much value as possible to okay. the people. What are for you, um, if you have to advise companies on influencer marketing, what are three do's and don'ts um, for this uh, domain in marketing? Um, I think first of all, uh, let's start with the don'ts. Um, first of all, I think brands should really, they're used to so much control from A to Z, the whole process of a, of a communication campaign. It is not possible to have the same kind of control when you're working with creators. Uh, you, can, you can give them a, a kind of a box and say, okay, these are the lines and you can draw and do whatever you want between, uh, within those lines and that's fine. But you have to just let it go. Uh, trust us as a company or your agency. Trust the content creators you're working with. Um, because we're seeing, we get, for example, we get questions like, yeah, but we want to see the stories they're going to make first. 
guys <laughs> yeah, don't take the on, on you can't theory. create a story and say okay i'm gonna do it and if the if the brand is want to tweak something okay i'm gonna do it again it's it's completely losing all natural uh, um shine of it so so leave it there and and just uh it, you will be fine as a brand <laughs> um secondly i think it's don't try to copy the tactics. I've, I've told uh, it before in, in, uh, in our podcast. Don't try to say, okay, this has been working on Facebook for the last 10 years for us. Let's do it the same way with influencer. It, it just isn't. It, it's not the same kind of influencer of the same kind of marketing. It's a completely different kind of uh, communication. Uh, so don't try to copy paste tactics. Um, and then third of all, um, I think it's really uh, important to try to uh, stop working with the usual suspects. We always get briefings from brands who say, okay, we want to work with this guy, this girl, and, and they have their own personal top five or top 10, whatever. And it's, you have to think about, when you think in influencer marketing, it's actually, it's about who you're trying to reach and not they're just uh, an agent between actually the, the brand and the followers, right? So they have to stop freaking and, and, and focusing on, okay, we like this guy on TV or on, uh, on radio, so we need to work with him because nine out of 10, he doesn't need even create great content. He, he has maybe 100,000 followers because on, he's on TV each day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean he's going to create great content for you. Um, for the do's, uh, I think it's important to really think um, about how you can, s uh, well, spend enough money in production. Um, it's it's not enough to think because they're content creators that they can just on their own. Uh, the, 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 the amount of uh, influencers in Belgium who create fantastic content on their own are really limited. So that's one of our roles to help them, to, to give them ideas, to, to bring added value as, as a creative team to say, okay, what about if you do this? What about if you go there? Um, so we try to, our briefings towards influencers mostly are between 10 and 15 pages. Okay. Uh, really, uh, so this is a mood board. This is where, where you need to go. This is the kind of content we like. This is the kind of content that the client likes. So it's really important for us to, to show them what we expect from yeah, them. To give them uh, the feeling that, that uh, they... Uh, yeah, exactly. Them. So they, they don't need to do what we s tell them to do, but we, we try to inspire them as, yeah, as, as much yeah. as we can. Inspiration is a good yeah, word, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, so secondly... I think as a do, uh, our best campaigns are when we are involved at the beginning of a creative uh, process. Um, it's We get very limited uh, and, and also limited results when we are involved like, okay, we have our TV spot, we have our radio um, um, commercial ready, we have some print done, we have some Facebook assets. Translated now let's let's do to, yeah, some influencer yeah. marketing. We we have we still have 10k left. Okay, let's yeah. do some influencer that marketing. Doesn't work. Doesn't work because it's uh, it, well. Ideally, it's it it fits all together, right? Our best campaigns are when we're sitting, even with the big lead agencies, uh, with our brands and strategic strategically think about how can we involve content creators within this whole big ID. Mm -hmm. That's that's the best thing you can do as a brand. And then thirdly, and, and it's a bit linked with the second one, it's think about beforehand how you can reuse the content that we're going to produce for you or the content creators are going to produce for you. Because we get a lot of questions like at the end of the campaign, like, yeah, actually it's such a great content that we, we would like to um, use it in print and use it in our stores and, 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 and then... Uh, influencers are getting away the minute I didn't sign up for uh, uh, buying out my, my content and be on, on, on uh, in your stores so that's something that if you do it well you can create content co-create content and have a whole 360 uh, approach which uh, where you reuse the the same content and it's getting great results Okay, but that's a very clear answer. Thanks. So let's get to the key takeaways. So the three don'ts were don't copy tactics, don't always use the uh, the, yeah, the usual suspects. And then the third one is uh, 
don't uh, don't be too freaky about controlling ah, the whole yeah, process don't, yeah, you yeah lose control yeah, yeah. yeah okay clear so the three do's were uh, involving your agency from the start investing enough in professional uh, production mm -hmm. um, and repurposing the content exactly. that's right okay yeah. great uh, okay thanks Bert then to close our conversation or to end our conversation I have five more short questions you can answer uh, really short um, and the first one is what is your favorite marketing book my favorite marketing book is uh, by now an old one if you want to uh, but I think when I was starting at Twitter, so that's 2014, one of the first book I was recommended by one of my American colleagues was uh, Jeb, 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 Right Hook from uh, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would still recommend it to anybody who would uh, like rethink his uh, social media strategy because there's a lot of valuable reasons in it. Some of them will be probably obsolete. Um, others, I mean, there's new platforms that that, the, that are uh, nowadays more popular than, than five years ago probably. But it's a very, a very nice book to start uh, with how to rethink your social media yeah. strategy. I agree. Um, next one is, who's your favorite marketer? Um, the one I appreciate the most for how he articulates uh, very difficult stuff in really easy language, I think, is uh, Seth Godin. I, I, I don't know if you saw him on Supernova when he came to Antwerp, but he keeps astonishing me the way he explains things. And I always feel like that's 100% right. And all marketeers should at least see him speak once because he's really uh, touching the, the sweet spots of how to, to think about marketing in 2019. Or read one of his books. Or uh, read because, one of his books, uh, yeah, yeah. The new one, This is Marketing, is yeah. like very good. I'm uh, reading it too. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Um, okay, uh, the next question is, um, who, what, what's your favorite campaign? My... Of all time. Of all time. <laughs> You know, um, it's probably going to surprise uh, a lot of people, but I actually have so much respect as a businesswoman for Kylie Jenner. Okay. Um, she was the first uh, billionaire uh, at 20, 21 years old, I think. But the way she uses her social media channels to build a company to me is astonishing. It, 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 it shows how weak retail is today uh, because she's doing everything on herself. She's, she's building this huge empire just by being Kylie. And to me, it's, it is by far the, the, the best um, marketing campaign in terms of investment versus ROI. She's, she's just posting one post and she sells probably couple of hundred thousand dollars in, in uh, of her own products yeah, with I one post imagine. yeah it is a good example actually but it will surprise a lot of people <laughs> uh, and then the next question is what is your favorite brand i'm gonna go in the same uh direction actually um it's i i'm not wearing anything but i i'm, I'm i usually wear a lot of uh stuff from them it's uh suspicious by antwerp ah, i know these guys uh, so. um i think it's amazing again how they're using the whole like okay, it's it's kind of a copy paste from from the the whole supreme uh, strategy, like uh, working on scarcity, but I think it's very cool the way they are um, actually contracting like the biggest uh, fashion models, uh, socialites in the yeah, US. They, they worked with Bella Hadid. Huh? Uh, yeah, the amongst them. Yeah. If you go to their account, there they're working with with really the, 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 the whole bunch of, of the biggest um, uh, celebrities in the States. I don't know how but they do yeah, it. Yeah, that's my next question. Is it profitable? Yeah. Uh, good question. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question and I, I, I'm really surprised how, how they can keep it up because it's, I mean, it's clothes. Uh, margins are way bigger on luxury products, for example. So it's it's kind of amazing to me too. But I think they're doing a great job, at least for trying to to break the the barriers as yeah, a, as a Belgian company. And as two young guys, it's as two uh, young guys, uh, yeah, students, pretty, I've heard. Yeah, students. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty fascinating. Yeah. Okay. And then the last question would be, um, and maybe we can uh, stay into the influencer marketing game. What is that one trend, if you have to pick one, that will be the biggest game changer in the next 10 years? Oh. Let's stick to Belgium because I think uh, 
whatever is happening in the states or in uh, in, in in China will more will need unfortunately more than 10 years to come to Belgium <laughs> because we keep being late adopters yeah. but at the same time it's interesting for us uh, even as a company uh, that we're so uh, 100% convinced that we haven't seen anything happening on YouTube yet in Belgium it's 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 going to be totally different landscape in the next five years you're gonna hopefully see a lot more creators a lot more brands uh doing really good stuff on youtube so i think youtube is gonna explode in belgium in the next five to ten years okay so it's uh good to go there as a brand now it's a no-brainer especially because it's a blue ocean today um you just take the lead now, take the, the, the first mover advantage and you can capture so many eyeballs that other brands are, are just not thinking about. Uh, and it's one of our obsessions at Native Nation nowadays. Okay, great. That's a good statement to end this conversation. Uh, I want to thank you to be a part of the third episode of Modern Marketing TV. And I it's want to invite pleasure. all of you to subscribe to our channel. And for the ones who don't like watching, uh, you can, of course, listen to this uh, podcast on uh, Spotify as well. Um, and then Bert, thanks. Uh, and uh, see you next week.